Amen. He does have a wonderful name, doesn't he? And when, when you think about the words we sang today, uh, and that he, you just call on his name, and that just means something and brings things uh, to, to fruition. So we serve, a, we serve an awesome God and a mighty God. Uh, last week, uh, I asked a question, has your love grown cold? Uh, has your love grown cold? And we discussed how Jesus had identified uh, in the list of end times uh, signs uh, that the love of many uh, would grow cold. And he talked about that happening uh, with, because of all the wickedness. And, and, and we see that, and we kind of explored that a little bit on last week, that the more wickedness and sin increases in our world, that the more people think only about themselves, uh, everything's about them. The, you know, we read, as Paul had wrote, that uh, people would be lovers of themselves, not lovers of the good, and all the rest of that. And we see how our times identify with that today, uh, where people's compassion, if you will, as well, uh, for other people, People, uh, and their devotion and love for God seems to wane a little bit, that it, it kind of uh, lacks enthusiasm. Uh, they kind of go out of love uh, with just life sometimes in general. Uh, there are many times that we allow things uh, in our own lives to gradually get in the way of our relationship with God and we begin to feel distant. That can happen if you uh, have a bunch of kids as, as, as I have three of them, and your family grows, and that you're focusing with your family. You, maybe it's a career. Uh, maybe it's a hobby. Uh, sometimes you can get wrapped up into things that are very eventful, uh, such as sports uh, and all at different times. And it's just sometimes life uh, happens to us. And then there's this gradual separation between us and God. And that can appear to be a cooling period, uh, a time that it doesn't feel like uh, that your love for God and everything else is, is on fire uh, quite the way that it should be. But there are other times that we just simply make the decision at that moment to pivot and just run full speed the other way away from God. Uh, and, and I want to ask you this morning uh, just a really simple question. And I'd like for you, everybody that's here, or everybody that will listen later, or live streaming now, whoever, um, for you to really self-reflect. I don't need you to think about what somebody else is doing. Uh, or, or, oh, that's reminded me of this person. I just need you to think about you today. And I know this is counterproductive to what I was talking about before. But right now, I need you to be a little selfish. And just think about, are you running away from the Lord? All right. Um, and we're going to take a look um, at really the entire book of Jonah this morning. Uh, it's going to be uh, quite uh, difficult to read every one of the verses. So we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 3, uh, and then we'll jump uh, to chapter 4 uh, here a little later. But let's look at the first three verses. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Um, I believe that most everybody, whether you've been in church for a short amount of time, been in church for a long amount of time, you are aware of the account of Jonah. Uh, it is a popular story, uh, as I think I say in the notes, uh, and it's in the in a popular story in the Bible, but often it's just simply we're focusing on the fact that he gets swallowed by a fish or a whale or whatever, and he spent three days and three nights. You may find the occasional pastor talk about this during Easter uh, when it's it, Jesus' words are you know, hankering back to this, saying as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be you know, in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And then so somebody may talk about uh, the prophecy uh, in that and Jesus fulfilling uh, that prophecy. But outside of the fact he was the miracle of him being swallowed by a fish and that uh, messianic prophecy connection, you don't really hear too much else about this story. And again, I always hate to use the word story because people think that's fiction. I usually like to say the account. Um, but for context purposes, I'd really like for you to understand what is taking place uh, at this time. Jonah is one of the, the earlier prophets 
uh, of God. Uh, and he, he's, he's operating at this time. And we see here that God is instructing him to go and preach against uh, these people in the city of Nineveh uh, because God has observed that they are a very wicked people. So who are the Ninevites? Uh, Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian kingdom, the Assyrian empire. Uh, at this time, the Assyrians were big foes of Israel. They were known for their wickedness, for they were known uh, for their cruelty and the things that they did. They were uh, Im immensely effective uh, in, their, in their battle uh, tactics and all because they were pretty well ruthless uh, people. So they were, they were a bad lot. Uh, if you will, and the capital city uh, of, this, of this place would have had quite a number of really bad folks uh, in it and mean people, I would suppose. So, why does Jonah, what does Jonah decide to do? Huh? He hightails it out of town, all right? He decides, and what specifically, and I like the way the NIV puts it, in verse 2, uh, 3, excuse me. Can you throw that out there for me, Joe? But what? Let's read it. Jonah ran away from the Lord. Mm. Not a good thing to do, I would suppose. All right. But why? Why did he run away from the Lord? Because he didn't want to hear the gospel. Okay. Okay. Uh, so he... Jonah, he, he gets this instruction from the Lord, and then he says, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to run away from God. I'm going to get. I'm gonna go to Tarshish. He's going to board a boat, and he's going to go to Tarshish. Well, you know uh, that the middle of the story the, in chapters 2 and 3 that I'm going to summarize here, he gets on this boat after paying the fare you see here. He gets on the boat. They go out. They're on the sea. God sends a horrific storm. Every, the, the people on the boat at the time, they are really uh, scared. So they are not all uh, people of the faith of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, Jewish and Hebrews. Uh, they are pagans, and there's many different people, many different faiths on the boat. And they start all crying out to each of their individual gods, and nothing happens. Uh, Jonah, where is he? Do you all know the story? Where's Jonah during all this? He's asleep down in... <laughs> at the bottom of the boat. And so after they've cried out to all their gods and they've thrown all this stuff off of the ship to lighten the ship, they go down there and they're like, how can you sleep there in all of this? You know, don't you need to cry out to your God and what's going on? And, and he kind of tells them that um, he's not in a particular good place with his God and probably what they need to do is throw him overboard. All right. And they, being nice fellows that they were, for that, this particular moment, they were like, nah, nah, that can't be it, you know? And so they, they start trying to do all the other stuff I was saying, and then finally, they kind of go back, and they're like, yeah, I think that's the last, that's, this is the one thing we haven't done, and so there goes Jonah uh, overboard into the water. When he goes to get thrown overboard, what happens to the storm? So... He was right the first time, uh, wasn't he? So he gets swallowed by the fish. He's in there for three days and three nights. While he's in there, he spends time praying. I think that may make anybody start to pray uh, if they never have prayed before. Uh, and Jonah's praying, and, and, and he has a, a really good prayer. At the end of it, um, the, God makes the fish spit him out. All right? At this time, it says... In the beginning uh, of, of chapter four, uh, well, excuse me, that would have been chapter three. I, have, I don't want to jump there yet. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again, okay? And this is chapter three. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and he says, hey, go, don't do what I said. Go to Nineveh, preach against these people, they're wicked, right? <laughs> Jonah does it this time, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I mean, you know, after, after everything he's been through, he's a hard-headed man. Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches to the people. The people repent of their sins, even the king, okay? Um, and, and so God spares the city of Nineveh from destruction and from calamity uh, at, at, at this time because the people repented. 
You're thinking, success, right? I've gone to one of the worst cities on the entire known world at that time. I have preached, thinking of uh, Jonah, I preached to them. It's worked. They have repented. They have, you know, God has moved on this place, even through the highest levels of their government, uh, and the city is now saved. You would have thought, as a, as a prophet, uh, as a minister, check, that was a good day, Right? You would have thought that, right? Okay, you said wrong. I mean, we, I don't, we know that Jonah didn't. But, so that's what makes verse 4, I mean, chapter uh, 4, verse 1, peculiar. Because God has just said in the end of chapter 3 that he spared the city of Nineveh from calamity. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Hold right there, Joe. He became angry. Wonder what's going on with Jonah right now. Seems to be odd of a prophet of the Lord who has just literally had his rear end handed to him, you know, by God just bringing down all of this, you know, kind of instruction, I'll call it, on to him. Uh, and, and so he has went through some spiritual discipline and he's come out, I don't know, with a good attitude. Does he? It's a, a terrible attitude. A terrible attitude. Um, it, what seemed very wrong to Jonah? And let's look at the, the, the next several verses here. Um, in verse 2, it says, He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? So this is prior to, this is the first time he's answering the question Daniel was saying a while ago. That he's fixing to answer why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. All right. He says, when I was still at home, that is when I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. What? Look, look at that verse. Verse 2. Look at verse 2. The second part. That is why, that is what? I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarsus. What is he saying there? Look back at the full verse 2, Jay, for me. Thank you. What, what's, what, what is he saying? That is what I tried to forestall. What was he trying to do? What, what can you use another word? Give me some other synonyms for forestall. Prevent. Stop. You know, uh, it's, you know, it's to stall it, to, to hold off. He was trying to stop God. And what's he trying to stop God from doing? Blessing these people, saving these people, being gracious to these people. Something's wrong with Jonah. Huh? He is bitter. He's, he's, got, he's, got, some, he's got some major issues uh, going on. He, this is a prophet. This is the man that's supposed to be going out doing the Lord's will. This is what his job is supposed to be. That he goes out and he speaks the word of God to people. He is the, the medium by which God is using to get his word to the folks. And here you have this situation where that has happened. He knew that was going to happen. And that's why he didn't want to do it. And God had to put him in the belly of a fish. See, that's why, you know, look, not many people, you know, go this far you know, into just resisting God about something this good. Usually it's something that, that, that we, we're wanting God to do, you know, in a, in a, in a you know, he's, you're thinking he's doing something bad, you want to do something good. It's this kind of mindset that Jonah has, but it's not as weird as this. And so we don't have to get swallowed by fish all the time, but I can promise you that um, uh, it, it was needed for Jonah at this time to have some, a wake-up call like that. And you have your own moments to where you're, quote unquote, in the belly of a fish because you were running away or, or you had you know, your own way to want to see things to be done. Um, but let's look at uh, verse 3 going on. Now the Lord, it says, Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Because God saved the whole city of people, you just say, oh, Goodbye, cruel world. No reason to live anymore. He is being dramatic, okay? But the Lord replied, 
you know, I think this is the time the Lord's going, is it right for you to be angry? You ever been angry with God? You ever questioned why he was doing something, especially when he's doing something like this, when he is blessing people that you think have no reason or have, that they don't deserve to be blessed? Because you're looking at yourself saying, well, look at what I had to go through, and I can't believe that they're, having, they're getting this or getting that or whatever. And, and you're going to God saying, you know, why don't you do this to those people? Why don't, why don't you make them go through this or whatever? I can promise you he'll ask you the same question. Is it right for you to be angry? And that's why I want to ask you today, just think about yourself. Think about how, how Jonah's running here uh, away from God. Why did he run? In verse 5 it says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he had made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So he had said, I'm going to go out here, but I'm going to sit back. What he had done, when he, after he got done preaching, he had went up here and he had sat there just waiting to see. He said, you know, he didn't really believe what he was going to say was going to be effective to the people. You know, he knew God could do that, but he was kind of saying, well, maybe this calamity is going to happen to them. Maybe it's not. So he was, he was just kind of sitting there watching for something to happen, probably hoping uh, that God would, in fact, uh, you know, destroy the city. And so he made this shelter. He waited on it. He waited under it. Then the Lord, in verse 6, what a merciful God. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, a goad in some other uh, trans, uh, translations, and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been, been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it. Or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? What's the point? What's the point in that last part? Huh? Selfish, but we tend to care about things that no need to be cared about while there's much bigger things that we should be caring about. Uh, and I also like how God reminded Jonah that he didn't do anything to make that plant grow. It wasn't within his power to do it. Why does he have a right to be angry? Who made the plant grow? Who made it wither? We live and die according to the Lord. Jonah wanted to die. You know, he's like, I want to die. And then, you know, he's waiting under the shelter. And I'm thinking, Lord, what are you doing? You know, you're reading this and you look, you're looking there around about uh, verse 6. And then the Lord provided this leafy plant. I would have left him there in that hot stuff in the first place. You know, acting like that. But God said, you know, no, no, no. That God does this to us all the time. Certainly we have acted so childish and, and, and we've really been stupid. And rather than letting us wallow in our stupidity like we would do to, to ourselves or to other people, he'll come in and still be gracious and merciful to us while we're still just sitting there going, hmm. and he put this leafy plant over him so he wouldn't be in the, the heat. All right, uh, that way then he could go and teach Jonah later. But when you think about why did Jonah not go, he, again, it wasn't because he was scared of what was going to happen to him. He wasn't afraid necessarily that the Ninevites were going to kill him uh, or whatever. He just knew these were bad people. Uh, and he had such contempt for the Ninevites uh, that he did not want God's grace and God's mercy uh, to be bestowed upon them. And that's why he ran away from God. Now that is just, that is a weird story. 
when you're talking about people running away from God. Um, and you think, well, that's never been some of the reasons that I've ran away from God. So I ask you, you probably have ran away before. You probably distanced yourself from God. Why did you do it? You don't got an answer. I just want you to think about what were your reasons and what were Jonah's reasons? Not talking, I know, about the Ninevites, but what at its core was Jonah's reason for running? What it was the, if you strip everything back, what was the fundamental problem? Huh? No, he didn't. No. What was, she said he feared the Assyrians. What was at the core, what was Jonah's main problem in this and why he was running from the Lord? He hated them. He didn't have any love. He had in his own mind what should happen. Jonah, was, Jonah said, no, no, no. What God's plan is, is incorrect. It's got to be my way. This is the way I think it should go. And I promise you, every time you've run away from God, it's because you think it should be done a different way. You think God has been wrong. He's been mean. He didn't do this. So you're mad at him. And so you run the other way. Or it's just been that you got caught up in all of life's circumstances and you put him over here and said, I didn't need to talk to him anyway because he don't know nothing. I know everything. So you're out here tunnel visioned into everything that you're doing and doing it by yourself. And you're running away from God. So whether it's that inadvertent, gradual, you know, distancing that you have from God, or either it's that time that you turned around and charged him with injustice or being mean or whatever the case was, and you just tucked tail and ran, you know, uh, right at that moment and pivoted. But just about every time you can take it back to the basic point that we think we know better than God and our plans should be the way that it works. And I want you to submit to something right now. Aren't you glad he does not do things like we do or what we want to do. Oh, man, I am so thankful that he doesn't, that he doesn't display love like I may display love. I'm so thankful that he gives chances after chances after chances. I am thankful that he'll be willing to save the people like the Ninevites as wretched and horrible and wicked as those people are because if he didn't save them, he wouldn't save me. And here you have Jonah acting like people in the church act. Being downright mean and mad that God would just so happen to save somebody that believed different than them. That God just may have enough grace to go and, and to look at every single human being on the planet no matter what they've ever done. And he still loves those people. And sometimes we look at that and we go, we look at incontent. Oh, he would never save a person like Adolf Hitler. You better, you better sure hope he would. If Adolf Hitler had have repented of his sins and turned his life over to God, you better hope we serve a God who would have been merciful to him and extended the free gift of salvation to him because if he would not, then there is not a single person sitting in this room that he would do for either. We think that somebody else is worse than we are. Why? Because their sin seems to be worse? Any sin is the same to God. You do it once, and you have missed the mark. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The word the, the word that is used for sin means to miss the mark. So yes, the Ninevites missed the mark, but it would, it would seem to be a little bit uh, uh, concerning about a person's thought process and well-being, really, uh, that they would have such contempt that God would save somebody else. But again, we are like that in our own lives uh, sometimes when we deal with people. And, and what I submit to you, I think, uh, here in, in your notes is that it seems to me somewhere along the way I bolded this, Jonah's love grew cold, hankering back to what I talked about last week. At some point... 
and whether he started out this way, I'm hoping he didn't. But Jonah wasn't thinking and wasn't thinking in the right ways about these other people. He wasn't thinking the right way about Nineveh. He wasn't thinking they're in the right way about God. Because if he was, why did he run away from him? And I would just submit to you today that if Jonah will run away from God because God was going to be too gracious to somebody at another city, I can promise you that there are people today and probably people in here that run away from God for a whole lot less. And that you may be sitting here this morning not even really realizing that even though you're sitting in church, you are sitting in church running away from God. It is possible to do that. It is extremely possible for you to punch the time clock of church attendance, to preach, to teach Sunday school, to be a deacon, to be the associate pastor, to be the music leader, to play the piano or the keyboard or do the sound and cut the grass and drive the van, to just simply come and attend church and to do so distant from God in those moments. And I ask you today, do you, are you running away from God? Because you run the risk, as, as, as Jonah really ran the risk here, didn't he, uh, to bring down some, some real wrath upon himself. And it could have affected the people that were around him. Now, he did bring some wrath upon himself, being swallowed into the belly uh, of that fish. But his refusal to go uh, to the city of Nineveh, God could have allowed that to be a death sentence for those Ninevites. But God isn't that way. Uh, And then he still saved those Ninevite people. And I want you to know something today, that um, when you talk about running away or running towards God... Uh, let me share with you uh, two seconds uh, of a testimony, if I will. This past week, um, really the past several weeks, if I was going to be honest, have been an immensely uh, difficult period for me. Uh, many different things, many different reasons, not just about work. I fight battles on every front, whether it's at home for, cert- for whatever reasons, church, for numbers of reasons, work for numbers of reasons, and leading every area that I'm involved in gets pretty tiring, weighs upon one in, in times. And this week, a lot of things come to the head, and I was having just the lowest, and I don't get like this, which has been, it was scary to me. I don't, I don't I'm not prone to depression or uh, really getting low for a long period of time. I've always just had to pull myself up by the bootstraps and keep on going because i got too many people uh, that's depending on me. But I have not been able to, what had not, excuse me, been able to shake it. And uh, Thursday, I, I really, I just said, you know what? I'm ready to hand everything in. The bank, church, I even text Brooke and said, I'm going to have to go find me somewhere else to live for a little bit. And I was driving to church because I had said, I just got to get out of the house. And I was coming to church, and I was just tears flowing down my face. And I was fully ready to just hand it all in, everything. And I'd never been at that place before, never been that low. I can promise you that. And it was as if my own voice was speaking to me things that I have said before and out of my mouth said, you got to run to him, not away from him. And all of a sudden, it was like I was back again, thinking in the right ways, and I just started praying, God, I am so sorry. I was dealing with all this stuff. I I had prayed a little bit, but it was them kind of prayers to where you just go, God, fix all this stuff, please, and have it done in 10 minutes, and I'll see you in a little bit. And then you keep on going. But I just had to get into a place of surrenderance and say, God, I've been doing this wrong. I'm sorry. And at that moment, by the time I got from Tucker Road to pulling into the church, all of it was gone. All of it was lifted away. And so I ran to him. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just telling you, I know what it's like 
to run away from him while I'm standing up here preaching to you because it's been like that for the past couple of weeks. It has been a struggle for me to come in here and to do everything that I needed to do and for people not to know that I was on the brink of just absolutely losing my mind. All right? I get it. It happens to every single one of us. But I can stand, if, if there's any reason why I had to go through all of that, it was so I could tell you this today with authenticity. If you are running from God this morning, stop it now. Stop it today. Stop and say, no, I can't do it by myself. I don't care if I think it should be a different way. And just say, God, this is yours. I'm here to do what you said. I was in the belly of a fish for a little while. It was a little longer than three days, it felt like. But I was in there for a little bit. And, and thankfully, after I prayed, it let me be spit out. And so I'm back. I, you know, I'm not saying you're Nineveh or nothing, okay? Um, <laughs> but but uh, you, have, you have those moments. And I just really felt that there's people here today and people that would listen that you think, well, running away means I'm out there in, in this flagrant sin and all of that other kind of stuff just doing horrible things. That doesn't always mean that at all. You can be doing it while you think you're doing the Christian stuff to be doing at that particular moment. But I can promise you, we serve a mighty God who will even let a shade grow over us while we're sitting there wallowing in self-pity, all right? And if you don't know him today, then I ask you, don't leave this place before you know the Jesus that I know. The God that can say, you know what? You should have known better, Corey, and yes, I should have, and yes, I did, and yes, it was easy to tell y'all how to do it than it was for me to put it in practice in my own life in that particular uh, moment in time, but he still provides grace and mercy and will restore you even when I don't deserve it. All right, let's pray. Father God, I come to you, Lord, right now, and I'm so thankful. Lord, that you saw fit to look ahead to the needs of those 120,000 people in that city that didn't know their right from their left, even were concerned about the animals in that city, that you have such grace and such mercy and such love within you, uh, that, Father, that you, the, the, the needs of the Ninevite people, the needs of the Assyrian people, uh, Lord, were just paramount in your mind at that time because I know, Father, that if you were not a God that had that kind of love for that kind of people, uh, the Lord, that every single one of us right now here in this room would be lost and we would be undone. And Father, I know that we are living in some, some very difficult times, some, uh, some, some very confusing, uh, tiring uh, times, Lord, with not really knowing uh, what's going and what's coming. Uh, Father, sometimes, uh, but Lord, I just pray that every single one of us in this room this morning, that we, Father, would turn to you in those moments to where it is the hardest thing to do for us to surrender what we think to the foot of your cross, but Lord, that we would run towards you and not run away. We would learn uh, from what we've seen just with, with Jonah in this story that he, he was running away from you. He was trying to stop your plans. And Lord, your plans didn't get stopped. Your plans didn't get forestalled, Lord. That it all happened in the way that you wanted it to happen. And Jonah grew and learned from it. Uh, and Father, but that we would just listen to your direction uh, the first time. Uh, Father, and that we would, we would do the things that we would need to do. And, and again, Father, I pray that if there's anyone that is here this morning, uh, that Father can identify uh, with, with some of the things that were said today. That they wouldn't wait till tomorrow. They wouldn't wait another week. Uh, Father, they would, they would today, right now, be willing to say that they have not been doing things right and that they need to surrender and they need to just let go of the things that are going on in their life. Father, and I pray that, that, that they wouldn't leave uh, without, Lord, having someone to pray with them, uh, Lord, and to agree together, uh, Lord, that we want to serve you as fervently uh, as we possibly can. Go with us, Lord, as we leave this place today. Keep us safe, uh, Father God, and bring us back in our midweek services. We come here to study your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.